Um, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker tonight, Amy Hungerford. She is a professor of English and Dean of Humanities at Yale University. She's the author of three books, known as a teacher to audiences all over the world through her free online lecture course, The American Novel Since 1945, available through Open Yale Courses. Ms. Hungerford fell in love with literature in her high school French class taught by Madame, a Parisian war bride brought back by an American GI to a little town in New Hampshire. That's sort of who taught me in Massachusetts, a Madame brought back. <laughs> French literature led in college to poetry writing. She earned a graduate degree in poetry from Johns Hopkins Writing Seminars, going on to earn her PhD at Johns Hopkins in 1999. Ms. Hungerford's first two books reveal how American writers reimagine human experiences such as genocide and religious belief in the 20th and 21st centuries. Through immersive research on the communities and chains of influence that shape creative writing today, her new book, Making Literature Now, gives us a literary history of the present as it unfolds. So I'd like to welcome Amy tonight. Um, before um, we dig right in, I'd also like you to know that tonight um, Amy's going to invite you to join her in, um, in reading some scenes from Salinger's plays. And we have CATV in the back who um, will be um, recording our evening. So thank you and welcome. I'm just being powered up here. <laughs> OK. Just Thanks, Sarah. And, and thank you to First Wednesdays and to the Vermont Humanities Council um, for hosting this, uh, this excellent series that you all um, can enjoy. It, it's a wonderful thing. Um, because I know we're kind of in Salinger country, I, ha I have to ask a question first. I'm not going to do that gauche thing where you ask, the audience, you know, how many of you ever met J.D. Salinger? Instead, I'm going to ask, how many of you know someone who met J.D. Salinger? <laughs> All right, excellent. So with that sort of wonderful spirit in the room, um, I want to say that uh, my own relation to Salinger's work um, began when I read Catcher in the Rye, I think for a graduate class. I didn't read it at the classic time, adolescence. Um, and then I came back to Salinger when I was writing about religion and literature. Because um, particularly this novel, which I'm going to talk about this evening, Franny and Zoe, really has religious content in it. it it's saturated with the story of a young woman who is trying to follow the um, call to pray without ceasing that she finds in um, the spiritual classic, Russian Orthodox spiritual classic, The Way of the Pilgrim. So this is a novel saturated with religious thought and philosophy. And I knew I needed to think about it for my book. So there was only one problem. And that was that I hated Salinger. <laughs> and why did I hate Salinger? I hated the snarky talkiness of it. I didn't like reading those voices. So, you know, I read Franny and Zoe dutifully and thought, as a good researcher does, about how to think about its religious content in relation to its artistry as a novel. Oh, it was hard, unpleasant. And then, as one does, I read, I wrote, I went to sleep, I ate, I read, I wrote, I went to sleep. And 4.30 one morning, I woke up and I said, aha, I know what Salinger is doing and why those voices are in the novel. So what I discovered in that moment of uh, insight is the origin of what I want to do together tonight, which is to think about the dramas. Now, my title was a little bit uh, deceptive. My title was Salinger's Family Dramas. I couldn't care less about Salinger's biography. It's Salinger's characters' family dramas. And the particular dramatic quality, and I mean theater 
when I say that, that we're going to think about together tonight. And in particular, I want to think about the voice and the human voice, why it matters to Salinger's work. So um, beginning with the voice, how many of you have ever done theater or have ever sung? Thank goodness. If no one had raised their hands, I would be very concerned with my plan. Um, so I need volunteers, and I'm going to need quite a few volunteers tonight. Um, I need two volunteers uh, to read a scene with me. Please, come up. This will be so much more fun if we get the, the voice of Salinger on its feet. This is how they talk in. Uh, you want to come up? Fantastic. OK. Now, we're diving right into a scene from Franny and Zoe. Um, we are in a New York apartment. And what we have here is Mrs. Glass, who is the mother, and Zoe Glass, the son, the grown son. And they are in the apartment. Franny ha is, a, is a young girl at college. She has come home from college because she's having a nervous breakdown. She's been trying to, pr to, to pray without ceasing. And she has seen the emptiness of the world. This has made her see how hollow it is and made her see her professor as inauthentic, her boyfriend as a cad. And we'll hear more about Lane later. Um, it's just kind of rocked her world. And so she's at home crying in the living room. And Mrs. Glass, Bessie Glass, is very worried about her and has sent Zoe to talk to her. Um, and so a lot of the scenes in the novel revolve around getting Zoe to talk to Franny to see what's wrong and see if he can help her. So we have, we have a scene. And one thing that I want um, to, to just note for, for our actors is that I'm asking you to do something that is usually quite hard, which is just sight read and pull out the dialogue from the scene that you'll see. So um, what's happened, we'll go, we'll go back to an earlier part of the scene uh, a little later in my, in my talk. What has just happened is that Zoe's been in the bath, and Bessie has been in the bathroom with him, chattering away at him, annoyingly. We'll get more of that later. So finally, Zoe gets out of the bath, and you know, M Mrs. Glass has gone about her business. And then they bump into each other in the hall. And that's where this scene picks up. And Bessie, you start with this line here. Mm -hmm. OK, so she And yeah. Zoe, um, you're going to, she's, she's going to start there. And you, let's see. Uh, this is your first line I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And all, my only advice is go slow enough so that both you and the audience can enjoy the words. And we're going to give you microphones so that everybody can hear them as well. Just add to the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So you ready? <laughs> I thought you'd gone. I thought I'd heard the front. What is that? Pers perspiration? <laughs> it is perspiration. Per perspiration, I believe. What it says, perspiration. Does it really? <laughs> well, it does. Which is why I corrected my first Fantastic. <laughs> what in the world have you been doing? You just had a bath. What have you been doing? I'm late now, Fatty. Come on. <laughs> One side. When? Who put this? <laughs> who put this monstrosity out here? Why are you perspiring like that? Did you talk to Franny? Where have you just been? The living room? Yes, yes, the living room. If I were you, incidentally, I'd go look in there for a second. She's crying. Or was when I left. Come on now, I mean it. Get out of the... She's crying? Again? Why? What happened? I don't know. For 
Christ's sake, I hear poo books. Come on, Bessie, step aside. Please, I'm in a hurry. Change that shirt, young man. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you. you can keep that. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, we had talented actors, uh, but I also want to note, and you probably observed, just um, how natural it sounds to read these scenes as drama, as scenes. One thing that if you read this novel, if you go home and read it, or if, you've, if you're remembering it, that you would notice is that it uses confined spaces, sort of unified uh, small rooms in which usually two actors speak to each other, two characters speak to each other. So it has a kind of perfect setup for feeling like a play. Now, um, Salinger never allowed his works to be performed as drama. Many people wanted to do so. And Salinger himself and the estate have not allowed this. And it's a mysterious question, why is that? Um, I think I have some ideas uh, as a literary scholar about why that might be. But I think our first step in thinking about Salinger's use of drama within the family comes from this very natural sense that these voices are meant to be embodied. The bodies jostle each other in space, and you very naturally just on the first look at the scene began to act it out in gesture. And many of the scenes read like this, and so we'll hear a few more. Now, Salinger felt that not all conversation was created equal, even though he was um, a great lover of the human voice. I'm just going to put these down here. Uh, there are other moments in the novel that are not very successful as conversations. Um, and I'm just going to read you a little bit, myself playing two parts from a scene quickly so that you can hear one of the alternatives to that lively sense of drama that we just saw. Um, and it is a scene that Zoe is reading. He's been given a TV script. He's an actor. Um, he's been lying in the bath looking at the script and also looking at a letter from his brother, Buddy. And here's what he reads. This is the example of conversation from the world of TV that Salinger gives us. Uh, so it's a little excerpt. We don't have any context for this. Tina, morosely. Oh, darling, darling, darling. I'm not much good to you, am I? Rick, don't say that. Don't ever say that. You hear me? Tina, it's true, though. I'm a jinx. I'm a horrible jinx. If it hadn't been for me, Scott Kincaid would have assigned you to the Buenos Aires office ages ago. I spoiled all that. I'm one of the little foxes that spoil the grapes. I feel like someone in a terribly sophisticated play. The funny part is I'm not sophisticated. I'm not anything. I'm just me. Oh, Rick, Rick, I'm scared. What's happened to us? I can't seem to find us anymore. I reach out and reach out, and we're just not there. I'm frightened. I'm a frightened child. I hate this rain. Sometimes I see me dead in it. Rick, quietly, my darling, isn't that a line from Farewell to Arms? <laughs> Tina turns furious, get out of here, get out. Get out of here before I jump out of this window. Do you hear me? Rick, grabbing her, now you listen to me, you beautiful little moron. You adorable, childish, self-dramatizing. And then Zoe is done with that. That's another form of drama that Salinger inserts into the novel. It sounds quite different. Histrionic still, as Bessie and Zoe are in their scenes together, um, but full of cliché, full of pretension, uh, full of 
uh, sentimentality. So Salinger gives us um, that as the kind of low version of the human voice in conversation with another human voice. We get that sort of mass culture version. Now, we have other versions. I want to get one other sort of baseline in our minds. Um, and that is the conversation that we get between Franny and her boyfriend Lane in the first part of the novel. Okay, so Franny and Zoe is two sort of stories. One is a short story, came out in the New Yorker in 1951, uh, and that's Franny and the Zoe novella came out in 1957, and they were published together as a novel in 1961. And in the Franny part, we have Franny going to meet her boyfriend Lane. I believe it's at, at the Princeton Junction Station. And it's the, a big football weekend. And uh, she's come up from Vassar so that she can spend the weekend with Lane and go to the game. And she's in the middle of her nervous breakdown at this point. And it's after this that she'll go back to the family apartment in New York. So can I have a Lane and a Franny? Two more volunteers, a lane and a franny. Don't be afraid, this will make it so much more interesting. Come on, please. Go, go. Yes, okay, awesome. You'd like to be lane. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you totally sure? <laughs> right, so this is you. Okay, we need a franny. You have a franny? Come on, we're going to run out. We got, thank you. We, we have more scenes to go. Do it for all. Well done. <laughs> so okay. Lane is going to start here. Uh -huh. And you don't have a lot of lines, Franny, because, Good. well, we'll see because why. I, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to read up. Oh, yes, your microphones. You need those. All right. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think you're. I think. Yes. I think you're good. All right. Now I'm just gonna say. I'm just. Oh, you have it. Oh, you're right. It is not. There we go. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna read you just the first few lines, and then Lane, it'll be your turn. We're gonna catch. You won't really understand what Lane is talking about because we're breaking in in the middle. And so we're not even in this scene when you read along in the novel, you're not really quite sure yet what he's talking about. So no, don't be worried if you can't f sort of follow it. Lane was speaking now as someone who has been monopolizing conversation for a good quarter of an hour or so and believes he has just hit a stride where his voice can do absolutely no wrong. <laughs> I mean, to put it crudely, the thing you would say he lacks is testicularity. You know what I mean? Lacks what? <laughs> Masculinity. I heard you the first time. <laughs> anyway, that was the motif of the thing, so to speak. What I was trying to bring out in a fairly subtle way. I mean, God. I honestly thought it was going to go over like a goddamn lead balloon, and when I got it back with this goddamn A on it in letters over six feet high, I swear I nearly keeled over. <clears throat> Why? Why what? Why did you think it was going to go over like a lead balloon? I just told you. I just got through saying this guy Brooklyn is a big Flaubert man, or at least I thought he was. Oh, this is marvelous. I'm so glad it's not about 20 to 1. I hate it when they're absolutely all gin. Thank you. They're sitting at a bar and she's drinking martinis. I forgot to tell you that little part. Uh, all right. So thank you, Franny. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Lane. That was fantastic. Um, what's wrong with this kind of conversation? You know, this is intellectual, I guess, in a way that um, that the, the TV scene is not. Um, but the problem is that Lane approaches his conversation with Franny first by monopolizing it, 
by holding forth, and that's definitely not what Salinger thinks of as effective human communion in, in the realm of the voice. He thinks that it has to be this back and forth, the repartee that you hear between Bessie and Zoe in that first scene that we, that we read together. So that's one problem with it, is that it's not reciprocal. And Franny, as you saw, clearing her throat in the, in the um, surrounding text, it says she has to clear her throat because it's been so long since she said anything. <laughs> so Lane has been holding forth. So the voice doesn't even function properly. And I would argue, if you read the whole novel, and we'll get to more of this later, that the fact that she has to clear her voice, clear her throat to get her voice to even sound properly is quite significant. Because Salinger is thinking a lot about not just the fact of conversation and what people talk about, but the ritual exchange of it and the sound of the voice, the timbre and identity of given human individuals. So there's one point later in the novel where Franny's on the phone and Zoe calls her up. The Glass family has this odd thing. They have an internal phone line that goes from uh, one part of the house, Buddy and Seymour's room, to another part of the house. Uh, I think the, it goes to maybe to various uh, places, but she picks it up in uh, near the parents' bedroom. And she picks it up, and it's, it's Zoe pretending to be his brother Buddy. But Franny knows, and, and Salinger says to us, she knows the timbre of each of her brother's voices. So that human imprint of sound is so important. And that allows us to read back in these moments where Franny has to clear her voice to communicate with Lane. Um, we can feel the significance of her imprint, her human imprint on the world falling away. And soon after that, she will sort of pass out uh, and, uh, and then we next see her sniveling on the couch in the, in the Glass family apartment. Now, I want to pause for a minute to what I said at the very beginning. I got interested in Salinger because I knew I needed to think about religion in this particular novel, and that he was someone who thought a lot about religion and spirituality and philosophy. What does this conception of the human voice have to do with the religious vision of this novel? I want to move to that question now because I think it actually is essential to understanding that religious vision. At the beginning of the Zoe part of the novel, um, we learn that it is Buddy, the older brother, who is narrating this story. And he has a long sort of um, delightful prelude in which he talks about the characters in what he calls his home pro, um, prose home movie, that's what he calls the story that he's giving us, a prose home movie. And again, there's the drama on the page. And he says that the, the actors in the home movie of his prose um, object to him mounting this production at all. And Bessie and Franny, the leading ladies, um, object on the grounds that they are seen throughout with red noses and in housecoats, and they really do not look their best. Zoe objects, he says, because he feels that Buddy has made this a religiously mystifying novel. A religiously mystifying novel. And that he's dropped the word God throughout, and that if you do that, and it's not, as he says, a healthy American expletive, then you are doing the most egregious kind of name dropping there could possibly be. It's too pretentious. But what Buddy argues back in the pages of this prelude to the Zoe part is that, in fact, um, Zoe is mistaken, that it is not a religiously mystifying novel, uh, nor is it a religious novel, but it is he says, a love story, pure and complicated. A love story, pure and complicated. 
So the question is, what's the relation between the religious content and, if we take Buddy at his word, the love story, the family love story, pure and complicated? So I would argue that it is in the voice somehow that religious content saturates the family love story. So now we're going to read together, and I'll need two really brave stalwart actors. Now we're going to read a, a good chunk of the bathroom scene, where Bessie comes in, Zoe's behind the curtain, and um, the two of them are going back and forth. And I'm going to give you some background um, while the brave among you are screwing up your courage to volunteer. It's a fun scene. Um, the background is this. So the Glass family, if you don't know, um, has a, a whole number of children. Two of them have died. And um, we know, and I'm just going to read a quick little description of Bessie that kind of tells you, um, tells you this uh, sort of fact. Here it is. Um, it, it tells you how Bessie carries this grief. So Seymour, uh, one son has committed suicide, and uh, another son um, has been killed in, in World War II. So this is what the novel tells us about Bessie's sadness and how it registers in her. It was a very touch and go business in 1955 to get a wholly plausible reading from Mrs. Glass's face and especially from her enormous blue eyes. Where once a few years earlier, her eyes alone could break the news either to people or to bath mats, depending on what she's looking at, that two of her sons were dead, one by suicide, her favorite, her most intricately calibrated, her kindest son, and one killed in World War II, her only truly lighthearted son. Where once Bessie Glass's eyes alone could report these facts with an eloquence and a seeming passion for detail that neither her husband nor any of her adult surviving children could bear to look at, let alone take in. Now, in 1955, she was apt to use this same terrible Celtic equipment to break the news, usually at the front door, that the new delivery boy hadn't brought the leg of lamb in time for dinner, or that some remote Hollywood starlet's marriage was on the rocks. That, it's a beautiful, it's one of Salinger's beautiful evocations of the face, the human face. Um, he does this throughout his work, and there are moments where he idealizes, especially Zoe's face. Um, but here we see Bessie's face, and we see that her grief has been sublimated into a set of neurotic um, behaviors and concerns and anxieties about the petty parts of life. But what that really masks is this deeper grief about the loss of her sons. So in the bathroom scene, I encourage you to use your, your ears to hear the hidden grief. Now, there's another little piece of context I want to give you. In the scene, they are talking about Buddy, who is, speak, who is um, teaching at a, at a college up north. He's a writing teacher. And he's living in a cabin in the woods. And as Franny's having her breakdown, Bessie is trying to get a hold of Buddy to see if he can help, if he'll talk to her. And she can't get a hold of him, because he doesn't have a phone in his cabin. So remember, he's in installed a phone between his bedroom and the rest of the house, but he does not have one upstate in the cabin. And Bessie is very concerned about this, and so you hear them talking back and forth about not being able to get a hold of Buddy. All right, so have my volunteers identified themselves in their hearts? Are they coming? I feel like this is like the right place to say this. Um, <laughs> um, who would like to be Franny and Zoe, I mean, uh, Bessie and Zoe in this scene? Come on up, this is the best, this is the juiciest scene if you've been saving yourself. It's a great scene. Excellent, thank you. 
<laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> this is Bessie's first line. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go to here. Mm -hmm. um, and go slow. It's a pretty quick, it, she's, she's, she's anxious and she's talking fast. So just go slow enough so you can enjoy it. Um, and this is your first line, Zoe. And we're going to go right to the bottom of this page here. And you can gesture. And remember that you, let's get you a stool and your microphones. Zoe, you are unfortunately naked in a tub. <laughs> <laughs> and Bessie, you're in a house coat, which you occasionally adjust <laughs> uncomfortably. <laughs> yes, nice, perfect. Uh, yes, very nice. All right, so um, Zoe, I'm going to give you a, a tub-like arrangement here. Oh, you could lounge on this. Why don't you lounge down there? That's great. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's good. OK. <laughs> you ready? I printed some of that new toothpaste they're all bragging about in here for you, she announced, without turning around and made good her word. I want you to stop using that crazy powder. It's going to take all the lovely enamel off your teeth. You have lovely teeth. <laughs> the least you can do is take them off. Who said so? Who the hell said it's going to take all the love of the enamel off my teeth? I did. I'll just... Mrs. Glass gave her garden a final bit of a glance. Just please use it. She nudged an un unopened box of sal hepatica. Hep 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 Sounds like a sal yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little bit of the trowel of her extended fingers to align it with the old other Semper Byron's in its row, and then close the cabinet door. She turned on the cold water tap. I'd like to know who washes their hands and then doesn't clean the bowl up after them. This is supposed to be a family of all adults. She cleans the bowl. I don't suppose you've spoken to your little sister yet. No, I have not spoken to my little sister yet. How about getting the hell out of here now? Why haven't you? I don't think that's nice, Zoe. I don't think that's nice at all. I asked you particularly to please go see if there's anything. In the first place, Bessie, I just got up about an hour ago. In the second place, I talked to her for two solid hours last night, and I don't think she frankly wants to talk to any goddamn one of us today. And in the third place, if you don't get out of this bathroom, I'm going to set fire to this ugly goddamn curtain. I mean it, Bessie. Somewhere in the middle of these three illustrative points, Mrs. Glass had left off listening and sat down. Sometimes I could almost murder Buddy for not having a phone, she said. It's so unnecessary. How can a grown man live like that? No phone, no anything. No one has any desire to invade his privacy, if that's what he wants. But I certainly don't think it's necessary to live like a hermit. It isn't even safe, for heaven's sake. Suppose he broke his leg or something like that. Way off in the woods like that. I worry about it all the time. You do, eh? Which do you worry about? Is breaking a leg or is not having a phone when you want him to? I worry about both, young man, for your information. Well, don't. Don't waste your time. You're so stupid, Bessie. Why are you so stupid? You know, buddy, for God's sake, if he were 20 miles in the woods with both legs broken and the goddamn air sticking out of his back, he'd crawl back to his cave just to make certain nobody sneaked in to try on his galoshes while he was out. <laughs> <laughs> Take my word for it. He cares too much about his goddamn privacy to die in any woods. Nobody said anything about dying. I've been trying the whole entire morning to get those people that live down the road from him on the phone. They don't even answer. It's infuriating not to be able to get him. How many times I've begged him to take that crazy phone out of his and Seymour's old room. It isn't even normal. When something really comes up and he needs one, 
It's infuriating. I tried twice last night, and about four times this What's all this infuriating business? In the first place, why should some strangers down the road be at our beck and call? Nobody's talking about anybody being at our beck and call, Zoe. Just don't be so fresh, please. Your information, I'm very worried about that child, and I think Buddy should be told about this whole thing. Just for your information. I don't think he'd ever forgive me if I didn't get in touch with him at a time like this. All right, well, why don't you call college? Instead of bothering his neighbors, he wouldn't be in this cave anyway at this time of day. You never have. Just kindly lower that voice of yours, please, young man. <laughs> Nobody's deaf. For your information, I've called the college. I've learned from experience that, this, that that does absolutely no good whatsoever. They just leave messages on his desk, and I don't think he ever goes anywhere near his office anyway. Do you have a wash bag back there? <laughs> the word is wash bag, not wash bag. And all I want, goddamn Bessie, is to be left alone in this bathroom. That's my one simple desire. If I wanted this place to fill up with every fat Irish rose that passes by, I'd have said so. Now come on, get out. So we, I'm holding a clean wash rag in my hand. Do you or don't you want it? Just yes or no, please. Oh my god, yes, yes, yes. More than anything in the world. <laughs> Does to have people in the bathroom together like that talking? I, yeah. Brothers and sisters, and uh, you know, all that. Well, I know my sisters and I used to do that. One would take the shower, and the other one would sit on the toilet, and, they, and we would chat. Uh -huh. But I don't know about other families. <laughs> we, I won't ask for a show of hands on that one. Thank you so much. So I hope you could hear in, um, in that conversation how. Bessie's concerns, you know, no one ever said anything about dying. You can hear the pain that the description of her face registers. And you can feel the way that Zoe uses his voice and his quick wit to parry and deflect, but also I think to connect. And what the very last piece of that scene is that Bessie hands the washcloth she won't throw it over, actually, um, and she hands it straight to his hand. And it's a lovely moment where they actually touch, almost, kind of. What Salinger's done is he has set up these two human beings in a tiny space. You can feel it, like in the, in the prose around it in this long scene, Bessie is clanging on the on the um, on the uh, wastebasket. She's messing around with lighters and cigarettes. She's putting the toothpaste up. He's sloshing the water. He's got the letter balancing from Buddy on the corner of the tub and also the script, so you can feel the wet and the dry. There, are all your senses are recruited to understand how these bodies occupy the space. And then your ear is recruited to hear the humanity of their relationship and the rich, uh, sometimes tragic, sometimes playful history of their relationship with one another. As it turns out, the drama that you see in the bathroom is just an extension of the way the family uses drama to connect. In a later scene, Zoe goes up to Seymour and Buddy's empty bedroom, and he takes out of the drawer Seymour's diary, and he opens it to an entry about Seymour's birthday. And what Seymour describes in that entry is the presents he got from his little siblings, Zoe and Franny, and then he describes how the family puts on a vaudeville show for him, for his birthday. So Les, the father, and Bessie, the mother, are old vaudevillians. And the children were all performers on a radio program called It's a Wise Child. So the whole family is a family of actors and actresses. And what Seymour recounts in his diary is this incredibly touching, um, funny vaudeville act that is his birthday present. 
So it has this kind of poignancy to it of, a, of an idealized past when the acting that happened in the apartment, and it's in this same apartment space where the vaudeville happened in the living room, um, you can feel that the drama that used to be enacted by that family is playful, joyful, an affirmation of Seymour's life, it's his birthday. And so then you can read this bathroom drama as the tragic inverse of that, with some of its vaudevillian uh, characteristics intact. The playfulness, the joking, the jostling, the comic acts and gestures. So here, what Salinger does is take a popular form which I think he sees as a richer form than the popular form of the TV script that we saw earlier. He takes the rich, older form of vaudeville and its very variety of voices, imitations, and so on, and he transposes that into the very stuff of family life. So remember back when I was meditating on, is this a religiously mystifying novel? How do we get from that claim that it's not, but he says it's not a religious or religiously mystifying novel, it's a love story pure and complicated. So we've established now the richness and the importance of human presence in the voice of the family drama. We understand how it works, but what does it have to do with religion? So remember that Franny's breakdown is driven by her desire to pray without ceasing and to have a, an authentic and meaningful spiritual life in the modern world. And she's withdrawn from the world to the family uh, apartment to try to figure this out. At the end of the novel, after many sessions of talking and crying and arguing with Zoe in the living room, um, Zoe finally calls her on the family phone. And so the voice in the phone, of course, is the only thing that you have. There's a kind of purity. Remember that, that uh, love story, pure and complicated. The voice is purified or stripped down when it's on the phone. And what Zoe says to her is that she should be an actress because that is her vocation. And he says that's the most religious thing that you could do, Franny, is to be an actress. Because for some reason, he says, in your past life, that's what you wanted, and now you are an actress. And he says, be God's actress. And then he says, the way that you be God's actress is to reach out to the audience to what he calls um, following what Seymour used to say to him when they were on the radio, imagine that out there in the audience there's someone called the fat lady. That oppressed listener, the person who is on the margins, and as always, as in um, Falstaff and Shakespeare's plays, the, the fat character is the most human character. It is the exaggerated humanness of flesh that the fat lady for Seymour represents. And he says, you should do your best for the fat lady. And so Zoe takes that advice that Seymour gave him and he gives it to Zoe. He says, you need to do it for every member of the audience for Seymour's fat lady. And he says, you know who the fat lady is, buddy? And he calls her buddy throughout this. So there's this weird way in which the siblings, through the nicknames, they kind of blend into each other. He says, you know who the fat lady is, buddy? The fat lady is Christ. Christ himself, buddy. The fat lady is Christ himself. And that's who you have to act towards. So there's a way in which the human voice in drama reaches out across to touch another human being across the space between performer and audience just as the human voices in the family drama reach out one person to another. And he makes this a kind of universal mode of sacred human connection by invoking Christ. 
But it goes even beyond that. And I'm going to read now from the end. And this is the last part I'll read for you, and then we'll, we can um, have some questions. At the very end, Zoe has said all these things on the phone. Ah, buddy, ah, buddy, it's Christ himself, Christ himself, buddy. And so here's Zoe, uh, Zoe uh, Franny on the phone listening. For joy, apparently, it was all Franny could do to hold the phone, even with both hands. For a foolish half minute or so, there were no other words, no further speech. Then, I can't talk anymore, buddy. The sound of a phone being replaced in its catch followed. Franny took in her breath slightly, but continued to hold the phone to her ear. A dial tone, of course, followed the formal break in the connection. She appeared to find it extraordinarily beautiful to listen to, rather as if it were the best possible substitute for the primordial silence itself. But she seemed to know, too, when to stop listening to it, as if all of what little or much wisdom there is in the world were suddenly hers. That dial tone, I think for Salinger, like the timbre of the human voice, is the very essence of the possibility of, of human speech. And I think that it's out of that space that Salinger created these stories that come to life in the way that we've so easily been able to do here among us just uh, on the spur of the moment with only the words that Salinger gave us on the page. We're able, out of the silence of these pages, they, they don't say anything when we open them. It takes us to voice them. But out of that silence, that dial tone, blankness of silence, this voice breaks. And Salinger imagines it through this sort of complicated meditation on what it means to follow a true vocation, how a voice embodies love, and what it means to connect one person to another through conversation. He makes that into a religious meditation. When Franny repeats the prayer, she empties it of meaning. It becomes a kind of mantra when she um, uh, repeats the prayer of the pilgrim. It reduces that prayer itself to a kind of dial tone, the empty sound. And it's where the human voice meets the empty sound that is, is the sort of divine space for human connection. And that's how the religiously mystifying novel is in fact the love story. They're actually the same thing for Salinger. They are, in the end, the same thing. So I'm going to stop there. I will be happy to answer questions, or we can have discussion about what we've, what we've read together. Thank you. <laughs> questions, comments, thoughts? Yes. So I think it's one of the greatest books of the 20th century, and, and I've loved it, read it a number of times. And I, I'm interested in the religious aspects of it. But I was wondering if you could explain why it is such a wonderful book. You talked a little bit about the juxtaposition of sort of the cliche world of the television script, and also the terrible, I mean, Lane is this terrible character, this yeah. caricature of an Ivy League prick, right? Yeah. He's sort of everything that's wrong with the material world of Stu. And Franny is the other end of the spectrum following the pilgrimage. She's like the goofy person that's taken up Eastern religion, like interestingly, people did in the 60s after Salinger wrote the book. Mm -hmm. People went to India did that. Our, my generation did that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Ian is sort of, he's almost like he's, he's, almost like he's looking into the future of, of the splits in American society. But, he, in a way, reconciles it at the end with the fat lady. And in a way, the, I mean, I'm throwing this out so I don't know yeah, sure. where you go yeah. with the engagement with the world. Because, I mean, I always read that at the end saying, yes, there are assholes in the world. And, and the material world is, is wrong and false. 
but there is also real deep meaning in everyday life yeah. you need to embrace it. It's, do you come out the same place? Yeah, I really do, because I mean, that is the line that, that Zoe gives her. And I think Zoe does carry the weight of resolution in the novel. Um, but I think the form of the novel does that work itself because it allows Bessie's petty, um, anxious, funny, endearing voice to be in the mix too. Um, you really see that um, love story pure and complicated. It's both those things. So the purity is sort of Franny's impulse to be idealistic, to be ascetic, to really take the, the, um, the call to pray without ceasing to its farthest extent and withdraw from the world. Um, that's the pure part, but the complicated part is just being in it, in the world and its complexities. So I think that's exactly right. That's, it, it's the incarnate sense of, um, of purity, which is no longer than pure. Or he thinks of it as possibly pure, but also complicated. So yeah, I think that is the resolution. And I that's, I think, why I like this novel and find it more satisfying than Catcher in the Rye. Um, Catcher in the Rye is very easy to um, kind of uh, categorize as the novel of a discontented, alienated adolescent for whom the world is just never going to be good enough. This one has more hope to it, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Want to comment about whether it's Salinger's life? Well, let's come back to that <laughs> if anybody wants to. Uh, other comments and thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's, you know, it, it, that's got to be um, significant. The transparency, the way we see into their life, um, also the, the beauty of, of, of glass, the way it lets light through. Um, there's also, there are tropes of light um, there's another part of the, the letter from Buddy that Zoe's reading in the bath where he says um, to, to, to Zoe in the letter, um, Seymour and I always tried to um, let you experience the human consciousness that Dr. Suzuki said is being one with God before God said, let there be light. And so that's another version of what the dial tone is, I think. It's that place of human consciousness and presence before God's word is spoken or any word is spoken. And then he, he imagines that Shakespeare and the Bible and Paradise Lost are all incarnations of the word that God speaks as the world comes into being. So light and glass, they're in that trope as well. Yes. Maybe the uh, dial tone is meant to represent the om. Yes, I think that's, yes. You know, the Buddhist, the Dr. Suzuki piece, there's so much that this reading puts together if you get into that novel. Um, it, it just, it all makes sense. All the little pieces fall together. Yes? Uh, you mean to buy some You know, I don't. <laughs> um, I think, the, the best you can do, sort of, is the sense that he's not mastered the, um, the meeting of the pure and the complicated, that he's too dedicated to the pure and unwilling to live with the complicated. But I think that's a, that's a, a question that people have struggled with um, for a long time in reading Salinger. Do you have a theory of that? No. No? <laughs> Other questions or comments? Do you want to ask your question about the biography? Yeah, well, I mean, he wrote these incredible stories that, that you know, affected a generation, and then he disappeared up in New Hampshire, and we don't know if he wrote anything more, and he became a hermit. And there was a very good PBS special on it that was, I just happened to catch on. I don't want to yeah. sit out there in all those interviews with people and do it. He was a party guy. He smoked cigarettes, drank a lot, chased people of the opposite sex in Greenwich Village. He was sort of, you know, what you would have expected for somebody, but then shifted. I'd love to know your thoughts about what happened. Yeah, so I brought with me um, the review of 
Franny and Zoe that John Updike wrote when it came out. And there's a really interesting um, little connection to this. So this is, this is Updike writing about Franny and Zoe. What, what year and where is he? This is 1961, and this is from the Times. This was the review that appeared in the Times, yeah. Uh, he says, few writers since Joyce would risk such a wealth of words upon events that are purely internal and deeds that are purely talk. We live in a world, however, where the decisive deed may invite the Holocaust, and Salinger's conviction that our inner lives greatly matter peculiarly qualifies him to sing of an America where, for most of us, there seems little to do but to feel. Introversion, perhaps, has been forced upon history, an age of nuance, of ambiguous gestures and psychological jockeying on a national and private scale, is upon us. And Salinger's intense attention to gesture and intonation help make him, among his contemporaries, a uniquely relevant literary artist. As Hemingway sought the words for things in motion, Salinger seeks the words for things transmuted into human subjectivity. So even, you know, Updike perceives the introversion of this, and there's one other review, and this is from, this is Leslie Fiedler, and I, I, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the source on this one. Um, He's criticizing, uh, he is criticizing um, Salinger, but here's, here's what he says. Um, Salinger, of course, speaks for the cleanest, politest, best dressed, best fed, and best read among the disaffected. And who is not disaffected? Young. He, that's all in, in, the, in a parenthesis. Not junkies, and excuse the language again, that this is uh, dated. Not junkies and faggots, but even upper bohemians, his protagonists travel a road bounded on one end by school and on the other by home. They have families and teachers rather than lovers and friends, and their crises are likely to be defined in terms of whether or not to go back for a second semester to Vassar or Princeton, to Dana Hall or St. Mark's. Their angst is implausibly cued by such questions as, does my date for the Harvard weekend really understand what poetry is? <laughs> or is it possible that my English instructor hates literature after all? <laughs> I think there's something about these responses that both signs in Updike's re review um, what felt inherently like an ascetic withdrawal or an idealization of ascetic withdrawal um, and the kind of criticism that made the sincerity of Salinger's work seem hollow. The fact that he chose this particular kind of family with this particular kind of education and life um, exposed him to a comment like Fiedler's. And that, so I think the withdrawal was in a sense prefigured. Um, I've heard someone else call his words, uh, call talk a hermitage. And this was well before um, he, he withdrew. But there's this sense that um, the fiction itself is a hermitage. I, I don't know. He, you know, he um, swore under oath in court in the 1990s, 1990 I think was the year, um, that he had continued to write. Um, and so people believe that there is a cache of manuscript in the estate somewhere. Um, but I think there was this sense that the world of the Glass family was a place for him to uh, inhabit imaginatively. And it was a space that he created out of language. And um, like Emily Dickinson, maybe he was wanting to live there alone. Yes? Uh, and I think I remember too that in the Joyce Maynard book, she claimed there were many stories. Yes. There were stories about the last time. Yes, yeah, that is the, that's the claim, is that, it's that there's a lot of writing and that, that it is about the, this family. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, in the back. I just wanted to go back for a minute. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold, my voice is a little. <laughs> um, 
But there were a couple of comments I wanted to kind of revisit for a minute because I think uh, what's interesting to me about this book, because I love this book too, but I really, really, in terms of discussing the glass family, I, I really think that like the book, <coughs> uh, Seymour in Introduction and Race Either Being Carpenters is like, gives you so much fuller insight into Seymour as like a character and maybe what, like I think there's a lot of guilt you get from Seymour and I think in the letters Zoe's reading, Zoe's reading in the bathtub, Buddy like really alludes to this sense of guilt they have as like older siblings, how much they expose their younger siblings to and maybe at like too young an age, like they talk a lot about that over and over again. And I think maybe that might allude to like some of the some of the motivation, because Seymour over and over seems to carry this guilt, you know, through the rock of his future wife because she looks so beautiful and he has to live with that because that's just who he is. He's motivated by these like bizarre, hard to explain needs to like bring people up to this higher plane of existence that he's at, but then he also feels like guilt, sort of, for doing that. Like, which I, I don't know. To me that's like really apparent, maybe in those other two. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think that's a pretty good account of the Seymour that emerges from those stories. You know, I think one thing that has always been a pleasure for readers of Salinger is that it is an, uh, an integrated universe among the different works. They're distinct and they're um, chronologically sort of spread around, but you can piece together this world. And in a sense, by doing that, Salinger invites the reader to inhabit it with quite um, uh, an investment of their own imagination. And the ambiguities of the psychology of each character um, kind of emerge and play and echo back from one work to another. So I think that's an achievement of this particular writer um, there are other writers, of course, who do that. Edward P. Jones has uh, a kind of set of connected stories that cover a lot of time and space and um, intersect with his novel, The Known World. War Faulkner, of course, is another. Um, James Joyce and the Dubliners. So there are lots of different writers who choose this sort of distributed form of fictional world making. But Salinger has had such a, um, successful intensity in producing this. Thank you very much. Thank you.